Welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS and a very warm welcome to our weekly review of international events. What we try in this review is to introduce you to individuals, events that are taking place in countries near and far and try to analyze and explain them to you how they impact on India's national interest and what are the likely repercussions on the big power equations. They are changing constantly all the time. That is the fun, that is the joy and that is the challenge of understanding studying international relations. And this time what we have for you is quite a plateful. Um, Iran has been counted as one of the explosive flashpoints for a number of years ever since the Islamic revolution took place there. It's been decades ago but in more recent past the crisis has brewed after Donald Trump reneged out of the nuclear deal which Obama had signed with Iran and imposed additional sanctions on this country. Ever since there has been a confrontationist attitude between a protege of uh, United States of America in Middle East Israel who considers its sworn uh, lifetime enemy Iran and there have been this uh, skirmishes between Iran and Israel and also the tensions rising between Iran and Saudi Arabia, another important ally of Americans. For the past few months, the attention has been drawn on whether Biden, after his election, would renegotiate uh, this comprehensive uh, plan for action to uh, persuade Iran to cut down on its enrichment of uranium, not try for weapons-grade uranium, and then the sanctions would be uh, removed. But this has not quite happened, although the world has been focused on this deal between Iran and the other parties will guarantee this deal, except uh, uh, Russia. Not everybody has stood uh, by Iran and supported the argument that unless the Americans who had imposed additional sanctions withdraw it, uh, Iran cannot be expected to make any concessions. But all that has receded into the background because of the developments other than the nuclear program which have been happening in the context of Iran. We shall discuss them in detail this time. Shifting focus, of course, not away from the nuclear deal, but besides nuclear deal, why Iran is important for international relations. The other side of the coin, as they say, of this problem is Israel. Now, Israel is again a theocratic state, very much like Iran, which is a theocratic state. Iran also takes its religious uh, ideology very strongly. It has ever since its birth positioned itself as an enemy of the Arabs. Arabs have looked at it as an enemy, as a stake driven into their heart against their will. There have been lots of military exchanges between Israel and the Arab side. Israel has ultimately, with the US support, managed to emerge victorious most of the time. There also have been negotiations to normalize the relationship between Israel and its uh, Arab neighborhood with mixed results. But re in recent past, what has happened is, since uh, Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu was ousted from power on charges of grave corruption and Bennett took over. There have been hopes that there might be a change in policy but right now it seems that Israel is bent upon behaving like a rogue state. It is ironical that the Americans would accuse Iran of being a rogue state and the rest of the world would see Israel uh, as a rogue state which, uh, which cannot be disciplined either by United States or by its patron uh, United States of America for a variety of reasons. So we shall see what is happening. Uh, uh, the Israeli government, Bennett's coalition government, has lost, lost its reserve in majority and there are rumblings of political inst instability in Israel. How would it impact on Palestinians? How would it impact on the oil politics of uh, Middle East? We shall, we shall see this also. Far removed from the Middle East and the Central Asia, uh, there is uh, another theatre where excitement is brewing. This is the north uh, of the Indian Ocean, which is where the Sea of Japan is there, where the Korean Peninsula is there, and not very far off uh, between the divided North and South Koreas, there is Taiwan, uh, which feels threatened by mainland China all along, and also the, China, uh, the Russians have put some pressure on Japan at the moment, uh, when Japan... Uh, First of all, criticized the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, then was a willing party to imposing sanctions, and then, of course, uh, in, indulged in 
military exercises with NATO. So the Russians have retaliated in a sort by saying that uh, Japan has not paid them the royalty for fishing rights in the Kuril Islands and there is tension brewing there. So this whole area is again now heating up and we will have a close, close look at it. Let us begin with Iran. Iran is a very significant actor in international relations. It always has been. It is a thousands of years old civilization with memories, despite the conversion of a majority of people in Iran to Islam, of a pre-Islamic past. They cannot forget that they have been a mighty empire with an expanded sphere of influence. Uh, they have had closed uh, civilizational ties with countries near and far, uh, including India. It is also important because it represents a nation uh, which is oil producing and oil exporting and the energy security of uh, lots of countries in the world is dependent on easy access to Iranian oil. But besides these two, there is a third factor which lends importance to Iran, which is it is basically a Shia nation. The Muslim world is divided into Shia and Sunni nations. The Sunni uh, Muslims, Muslims look towards Saudi Arabia as the custodian of the holy places of uh, Mecca and Medina as the natural leader. But Iran thinks that because in past it has been a cosmopolitan center of Islamic civilization, it is a natural leader for uh, the Muslim countries to look up to it. Though while the Shia Sunni sect divides the Arabs in the Middle East and the Central Asian Iranians, it is of comparatively little significance to Muslims elsewhere, especially in, in Africa, especially in South Asia, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, we should make a small correction when we say this Shia Sunni sect doesn't make a difference in South Asia. We should perhaps ex exclude Pakistan from consideration. In Pakistan, the Wahhabi uh, intolerance has increased in recent past not only in recent past, but decades since General Jia's regime, where the Shia and other minorities are persecuted, they are considered heretics. But India has the second largest concentration of Shia Muslims in the world after Iran. And if we come to Indonesia, which is the la largest concentration of Muslims uh, elsewhere, anywhere in the world, they have a very tolerant, humane interpretation of Islam, which has a strong Sufi imprint, although there also some intolerant speak has been uh, making inroads in recent past. But let's see this, that as far as the Muslims uh, are concerned, Iran is an important center of culture, of Islamic scholarship, of Sufi tradition, and people look towards Iran. So Iran has this awareness of its significant role in international politics. It played a very important role during the Cold War when Shahzad Helvi was a close ally of Americans after uh, Mossadegh, uh, the Prime Minister, was ousted and uh, executed. Uh, the American oil companies had a very vital stake in Iranian oil and Iran was supposed to be an ally in the Cold War against the Soviet Union. But ever since Shah was ousted, things have changed. The religious leadership is, views America as evil and is the sentiment is reciprocated. So this is what has created the problem between the American uh, during President Carter's uh, presidency, unsuccessful effort to secure the release of American diplomats who were sieged and uh, held captive by Iran. Uh, but this ill will, the Americans blocking access or to the Iranian funds to the Iranian government has created ill will. But all that is almost half a century past. What has created problems at the moment is the tearing down of an agreement between two sovereign states, uh, the President Obama and the um, leaders of uh, religious leaders of Iran about the nuclear deal. But right now what we are going to discuss is Right now, the nuclear deal is very fragile, hangs in balance. Uh, the Americans say that the Iranians keep adding demands like that um, the Revolutionary Guard should be taken off the list of terrorists, Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Americans probably were willing to do so when the report was leaked. It made it impossible for both sides to, go, to withdraw or retract their, from their position. Iranian top generals, who was the founder of the Quds, the guerrilla warfare, um, Kasmi's assassination uh, again created ill will. There have been attacks on nuclear scientists, installations, uh, denied at times, not denied, no comments by Israel at one time, but all this has created a long history of animosity between the Americans and the Iranians, Israelis and the Iranians. 
but the Iranians have a relationship with other countries in the world. That is what we are going to discuss with you this time. The policy in Iran has been to Iran has been looking east to borrow the phrase from the Indian foreign policy. Iran has started the phase of looking east. And why is this looking east important for Iran is because of developments in Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Now, it is estimated that about 4 million Afghan refugees are at the moment present in Iran. Now, these are predominantly not necessarily Shias, not necessarily Hazaras, but these Muslims create a problem because of the porous border between Iran and Tajikistan and almost porous border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan via Valley of Panjshir. Now, the Iranians are worried that in the garb of refugees, even if a small percentage of uh, Taliban Islamic terrorists enter Iran, it might be a challenge to their regime which is considered heretic by the Islamic uh, Sultanate of the Khorasan province or, or, or even the Taliban themselves. But the Taliban are more realistic. They know that they have to live next door to Iran and Iran can exert pressure on them or anti-Taliban forces can be given assistance as was done in the days of the Northern Alliance when uh, Ahmad Shah Masood was leading this front in Panjshir and Panjshir has only recently fallen to Taliban forces but the threat remains that any regrouping of anti-Taliban forces might take place in this region. Now Tajikistan is a landlocked country and the Tajikistan also has very close cultural civilizational ties with Iran. They are, Tajikistan is among the Central Asian republics which is not a Turkic nation. So. Turkey has also been jockeying for power in this area. It has an uneasy relationship with Russia, but it tries to exert its influence in what it thinks is the Turkic sphere of influence, where the people speak uh, a language which is of Turkish origin. They have a costume, they have a way of life which is closer to Turkey than to Persia. But Tajikistan is a different case. Now, Tajikistan is a landlocked country, and Tajikistan is very grateful to have uh, the access to the Iranian ports, Bandar Abbas or Chabahar, which could allow it to have a way to the wider world and warm waters. Now again, all these stands in the Central Asian Republic, Tajikistan in turn shares a border with Kyrgyzstan, with which it has had a recent water distribution problem. The, the, the politics in Kazakhstan has been also in turmoil in past. Um, there the legacy of Sultan Nurawev is disputed and his hand-picked successor has had to uh, grapple with uh, a coup attempt which, which was suppressed with uh, Russian assistance. And there is also, we must keep in mind that the Russians under Putin have always been very keen to reassert their control over these Central Asian Republics which were a part of the Soviet Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So there is, there is a arrangement, a treaty arrangement, collective security treaty organization, CSTO, which allowed Putin to intervene and bring back peace to Kazakhstan. But these republics also want to have an option where they can countervail Russian bearing down on them by maybe some reliance, uh, some closer forging, closer relationship with Iran. Now, this is an extremely interesting situation to analyze because if you see um, at the moment, thanks to the American sanctions on Iran, American sanctions on Russia, American sanctions on China, Iran, Russia and China find themselves on the same side. Now, Pakistan is on the fringes, Turkey watching carefully, uh, biding its time. But this is something which we must bear in mind, how Iran is carving out this sphere of influence. What Iran has done, the, one of the supreme leaders has visited Dushanbe and announced that very close to the city of Dushanbe, uh, factory would be set up to produce Ababil 2 um, drones which have a range of about 200 kilometers. Now, this is an extremely interesting situation where Iran is projecting itself as a supplier of military hardware and drones which can be very, very useful. Now, the Iranian drones are supposed to be less efficient, less effective than the Turkish drone which some of these Central Asian republics have sought to buy in past um, which is... Uh, Berakhtar uh, drones, but Iranian drones have proved their efficacy in the battle in uh, so, uh, southern Yemen, where the Houthis have used them to target uh, Abu Dhabi, target Saudi oil installations. So it is not as if that the that the missiles which uh, uh, 
Iran has at its disposal drones it can manufacture. Its technological capacity is quite high and this is attractive for these countries uh, in Central Asia also. So if you keep all this in mind, we have a very interesting picture where Iran can look east and assert itself and use it as a bargaining chip to get certain advantages in the nuclear deal. If you look not towards the west but look towards the east, we have an interesting uh, expanding sphere of influence of Iran where they fund Hezbollah, the army of uh, God in Lebanon, which is used to have some kind of a deterrent pushback against the Israelis when they ride roughshod over the Palestinians in West Bank or in the Gaza Strip. They also have been playing a role, the Iranian-funded militias have been playing a role in Iraq and Syria and it extends all the way to Libya. So you see that Iranians are not without their influence either in the Middle East or in the Central Asian part. Now this is the Iranian oil has uh, not been hurt as much by American sanctions. Um, they have been supplying oil to China, they have been supplying oil to some Latin American countries, they, they have attacked China, uh, tankers which um, threaten to uh, their security in the Persian Gulf area, in the uh, Bay of Hormuz area. But one more thing we, which we must see is that time is running short as far as the West is concerned. Within a couple of weeks time, the time limit for Iran to abide by the nuclear um, commitments which it had made uh, will be over. And then there is no sanction in international law which could force it to do so. There much has been made of Iranians uh, switching off cameras after a criticism by the International Atomic Energy um, Organization. The Iranian Atomic Energy Establishment made it very clear that these cameras were put voluntarily and if the Americans are being cussed, uh, Iran is not bound to have these in place and it is also said that any objective observer should see that 70% of the Iranian nuclear installations are already monitored adequately. So this is going to be a very interesting situation uh, in not only in Middle East, in the nuclear non-proliferation arguments and Iran increasing its influence in towards the East. So this is a situation which we should watch with care because we under American influence and persuasion have unnecessarily curtailed our relationship with Iran. Obviously under the threat that the Americans might impose same economic sanctions with us, we wanted to buy S-400 uh, batteries, anti-aircraft batteries from Russia, which we did. Americans dilly-dallied, uh, did not quite say they were giving us a permanent waiver, but knowing how they have allowed Turkey to do that, the Indians have been emboldened. Probably Indians should resume negotiations with the Iranian government. The Iranian foreign minister was recently in India. There was talks on one level, the Iranian side said that they had discussed uh, the insults to Hazrat Muhammad the Prophet in India and the government of India had reassured them. The government of India spokesperson did not refer to these talks, this part of the talks, but said that the Iranians had reassured them of age-old ties which they were having with India to be to reinforce. So perhaps the age-old ties are nice as a background, but what will be the overlap of our national interest would be the rebuilding of infrastructure in Chabahar or elsewhere in Iran, maybe increasing the oil quota sooner rather than later from Iran and also be sensitive to uh, the religious ideological sensibilities of the regime in power there. If Iran is considered to be an explosive situation, no less explosive or a serious enough uh, causing concern is the situation in Israel. Now what has happened in Israel is that after the signing of the Abrahamic Accords, it had appeared that Israel was normalizing its relationship with its Arab neighbors, not in the immediate neighborhood, but certainly the most important of the Arabs, the Saudi Arabs and the UAE. And they had started, uh, resumed normal flights, civilian flights, promoted tourism, given each other assurances about cooperating in the field of technology, including agriculture and nuclear technology. And the Saudi Arabs and the Gulf countries, the UAE, have been long preparing for a post-fossil fuels future, in which context the Israelis seem to be a very interesting partner. They were not next door. There was no clash of interest vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. They, the, the, these Arabs, the rich Arabs, had only paid lip service to Palestinian cause, never really been supportive, never taken the load of the refugees. 
they never were threatened with the retribution by the israelis so there was no clash of interest conflict of interest there also was an interesting relationship both israel and saudi arabia are very close allies of the americans the americans are the large, largest buyers of saudi oil they provide, uh, trump of course was bragging when he said if i withdraw the security uh, the house of saud will fall into uh, two weeks but that apart nobody took uh, donald trump seriously so these accords had given rise to the hope that israelis might slowly restore a semblance of normalcy with other arab neighbors also and this would reduce the tension in that area unfortunately this has not happened so there are two very interesting uh, trends which we can discern in the israeli politics one is large scale corruption while benjamin netanyahu had ruled for a long number of years a coalition government managed to have a precarious majority but when he was charged with corruption he was he was rendered almost incapable of remaining in power but people still think that he is the kind of a great manipulator he might come back again we'll leave the speculation about benjamin netanyahu's future uh, aside at the moment but what happened during his government was that he cultivated donald trump to an extent where the capital could be shifted from tel aviv to jerusalem and he was given support i mean the president trump would go there um, hand in hand and enter place disputed places this encourage the hardliner hawks in the israel to put pressure on the palestinians not only those residing in israel or in territories which were supposed to be part of the palestinian authority but which gradually the israelis have been encroaching on and having the settlers there and this is what the root cause of the current crisis is bennett who had replaced netanyahu has lost a uh, vote on a crucial law called the settlers law now the settlers law there is no agreement in israel about how to deal with palestinians in the those who stay in uh, gaza or those who stay in the west bank those who stay in, in the lands originally allotted to to the palestinian authority now the israelis say that they have been left with no option because lawless elements uh, terrorist elements and all since who are delinquents keep targeting civilians in israel there have been indeed cases where um, israeli citizens have been stabbed axed to death been gunned down and then the retribution of the israeli retribution has always been swift and far more barbaric than the original attack they claim that they are protected against the rockets being launched from the um, palestinian uh, t- authority territory because of their iron dome in impenetrable uh, anti missile system but the fact remains that the israeli vulnerability against suicide attacks remains uh, high all the time because if if the palestinian youth which has grown up in a climate of repression in the climate of violation of human rights brutalization there is no option for them they value their lives less they have been brainwashed into a jihadi mentality and the israelis israeli would be targeted anywhere especially the soft targets the israelis have been the israeli hawks have been very provocative they have barged into the mosque alaksa mosque when the palestinians were praying they have tried to disturb the prayer meetings they have tried to create a stampede and the israeli government has not been very even handed and just in doing this but the israeli society itself is divided not all israelis are hawks there are some israelis who are sick of this ongoing war with palestinians next door they they feel shame faced when they are accused of victims have been turned into predators they themselves have been uh, victims of a genocide but what they seem to be practicing vis-a-vis the palestinians in the immediate adjacent areas west bank gaza strip or the authorities uh, territory is nothing less than than genocide now the un has proved to be totally incapable important in controlling the situation the americans could have exercised some influence but they don't because the zionist lobby financial and in media is very powerful in america and the americans have one eye on their electoral priorities of senates the house of congress the forthcoming presidential nominations the primaries these are always ongoing and they keeping the jewish vote in mind they stop short of putting any pressure on israel and also the fact remains this is not only a theocratic uh, sympathies uh, towards the jews it is also the 
American interests are served if this thorn of Israel is play, placed deep into the heart uh, of the Arab lands and they can manage to control these these Arab uh, Arabs which are against um, the the USA were normally the uh, countries which were not very rigid about religious belief. They were Ba'ath Party leaderships in Iraq and Syria. They were leaning towards uh, Soviet Union. And even even in the war of in Ukraine, some very interesting facts have come out recently, where young students from Congo and Africa studying in Russia and Ukraine have fought on the sides of Russian against the Ukrainians because they think that the Russians are the aggrieved party and Russians are the ones who are sympathetic to the underdogs always. But that is besides the question. The question is that nobody sees Israel as a benign power which helps either the Palestinians or can understand their predicament because they have been victims themselves. But they arming themselves to teeth, they try to uh, ride roughshod over everybody else. Israel in recent years has projected itself as an important source of weaponry, armaments, supply and technology, including seeking new partners like India. Uh, their secret service Mossad is supposed to be very, very efficient and sharing of intelligence also is very important. Uh, the controversy in recent past about the Pegasus um, spyware which could, uh, which could be planted in the mobile phones and snoop on not only enemies but allies by the governments, uh, that controversy has died down at the moment but Israel has succeeded in surviving surrounded by enemies following a policy of brutal retribution supported by America. It is a very small country. It is not very rich in resources, but it is armed to teeth. And also when people said that some young Israelis are sick of this ongoing war, conscription, draft, and they want a dividend of peace. But this does not reflect in elections in Israel. You, when the votes come out, you still see that the hawks outnumber the doves. The centrists are few and some people even today are worried when this settler's law vote has been lost by Bennett that what is the alternative? If Bennett's government falls to which an Arab leader also is a party in his cabinet, then what are the alternatives? Would it mean that somebody like Benjamin Netanyahu or somebody having the same mindset would come back again and corruption would be rampant and the escape votes will always be the Palestinians next door. So what we would like to like you to consider is that Israel has steadily increased in ascendancy of priorities of Indian nation, Indian government and we have a very happy relationship with Israel as a supplier of light arms, technology, areas of cooperation are opening. But at the same time, Indians cannot say and it is not only a question of a Muslim population in India. Indians have traditionally been supporting the Palestinians Although our support to Palestinians has been more vocal than material in recent years, but it cannot stand up for blatant violation of human rights or crimes against humanity being committed where Palestinians are concerned. Slowly the Palestinians are getting away from the headlines. Other crises have pushed them away. But the fact remains that Israel remains an explosive flashpoint in here. Israelis have been threatening uh, Iran repeatedly by preemptive defense strike, but the Iranians now have started talking back in the same coin and they have said that they are in a position to destroy major Israeli cities. One hopes that better sense prevails and these kinds of ultimatums don't become the norm and maybe the process of negotiations can lead to, a, if not peace, a reduction of tensions in the near future. If we look at the map, far away from Middle East and Central Asia, there are other hot spots which are causing concern. And these are in East Asia, Northeast Asia, towards the northernmost tip of where Indian Ocean joins the Sea of Japan. And the Sea of Japan opens out onto the Pacific. Sea of Japan, close to Kuril Islands, touches Vladivostok. Suddenly, the temperature has started rising there. And why? Uh, ever since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Japanese have felt particularly insecure that Ukraine could not be saved from destruction uh, because it was not a member of the NATO, because the US was reluctant to come to its aid and 
come to its aid in the sense deploy NATO in a position where it could come in a direct conflict with the Russian troops and this might lead to a conflagration which might result into the Third World War. Now, the concerns are very legitimate. If the, if the Americans were reluctant to take on the Russians in Ukraine, can they be relied to come to the aids of Japanese where they have had aids, they, they have provided defense cover to Japan, but can Japan take it for granted that they will not again flinch and uh, exercise caution when it comes to directly meeting uh, the Russians? So the Japanese have invited the NATO to undertake military exercises and these military exercises have been in full force uh, recently in this area. The Russians have not taken very kindly to this. A, because the Japanese were one of the first few nations who condemned the Russian uh, special operations in Ukraine. They supported very vociferously the sanctions imposed on Russia by America and also have come with a time-bound plan that where the oil and gas which Japan needs desperately should be cut down from the Russian sources. So the Russians have shown their displeasure by Putin declaring that the fishing rights granted to Japanese in the vicinity of the Quirial Islands in 1998 are being withdrawn. The ostensible reason is that the Japanese have not paid the money which was stipulated as a levy for this, this purpose. The Japanese, of course, have always disputed the claim of the Russians on these islands. They say that four of these islands were forcibly occupied towards the last years of the last phase of the Second World War. They actually belong to Japan. So why should they be paying levies in Texas for fisheries and what belongs to them? So this unsettled dispute of the Quirial Islands is a festering source. But not only that, uh, the Chinese have been taking very precarious provocative uh, flights of fighter aircrafts over the Japanese air sky or, or infringing the Taiwanese air, air, air space. And more than that, there have been other causes of concern. Um, there have been threats of the seventh nuclear uh, test by Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Now, this has been uh, seen as a red line that North Korea should not cross. But that is amusing because the, in past also they have, they have tested six nuclear devices and heavens have not fallen. The only thing is that they, this is a calculated display by North Korea that it should not be provoked, uh, should not be pressurized and it, it, it is to indicate that it is the most powerful actor in the Korean Peninsula. It, it can threaten the security of Japan and it can also threaten the maritime passage in the seas nearby. People are worried if there is an accident, what might, what might happen? So far it has not happened. But the North Koreans have tested uh, long distance missiles, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and boasted that they can hit American targets on American mainland, not only American states in the Pacific Ocean. Now, this is interesting that the relationship between the North Koreans and the South Koreans is more or less a love-hate relationship. The South, there is a sizable number of South Koreans who believe that there should be normalization of relationship, even if there can't be reunification immediately, but there should be a easier passage between the two countries, divided countries. Lots of other countries' partition at the war have been reunited. During Trump's presidentship, Trump had also demonstrated that he as a strongman could deal with another strongman, Kim Jong-un, but nothing came out of it despite two high-level meetings in Hanoi and in Singapore, so is back again to square one. What is even more amusing is that not long ago there was speculation that because North Korea was suffering uh, by uh, spread of COVID and they were not in a position to treat their people, they had not been vaccinated adequately, they had been suffering from malnutrition, their economy is in totters. Is, is their testing of nuclear weapons only a distraction? Uh, uh, from their miseries, that again doesn't seem to make sense because despite the deprivations which North Koreans have suffered for decades, ever since uh, Kim Il-sung became the dynastic power there, they have survived despite all kinds of analysis and criticism that they don't produce anything, they are suffering from malnutrition, the people are, but they worship their dictatorial dynasty as almost demigods and they are prepared to undergo any suffering. They have probably known nothing better. So this distraction theory doesn't cut much ice. It only says that North Koreans continue to be propped up by the Chinese as the cat's paw where they can, without directly coming into conflict, create instability and destabilize the political situation, not only in South Korea, but to a certain extent in Japan and in Taiwan also. So if we keep this in mind, we also cannot neglect that 
from northern sea, sea you come down to the south china sea and you come to the indian ocean where cambodia is uh, situated the chinese have just been given access to riap where they are building a naval base now the cambodian government has of course said there is not a military base the chinese are only developing the thing but there is no doubt that the cambodians have provided total access including to building a naval base to to the chinese so this area again is something which will create problems now chinese have chinese attempts to uh, establish a toehold in pacific islands has not exactly borne fruits which chinese thought they would some countries have walked out they said we don't want any chinese aid we don't want to be dominated by any foreign country the australians have expressed their concern about the chinese adventurism in this south pacific region but the chinese can take it in their stride uh, in countries like fiji they may have not have made much water in fiji a yacht uh, uh, seized uh, belonging to a russian oligarch has been handed over to the americans so which means that in the larger island states in the pacific region the chinese influence has not succeeded but the chinese have managed to get some access into kiribati nauru uh, vanuatu uh, etc where their presence is divisive but its long term impact can only be speculated upon now this is a region where india has been interested in first as quads then even after aukus it is expected that india will play a role pull its weight in the indo pacific region but since the organization of aukus uh, not much has been discussed about india's strategic presence or role in the pacific region but india's role in terms of vaccine diplomacy in terms of cultural exchanges in terms of climate change in terms of technology transfers is considered to be important but then it is likely to be more confined to india's natural sphere of interaction and influence in asean region not beyond not certainly beyond that so we'll have to watch this carefully this is all we have for you this time but again as usual we would strongly recommend that you revise you review what we have discussed together with you we have discussed how iran is carving out for itself a sphere of influence both towards the east and west of the country and is trying to go beyond the curtailment of its sovereignty imposed by the comprehensive uh, program for action um, to curb its nuclear enrichment program within a week it would be out of the uh, out of the commitments it would be free to do what it wants to do and that would be a most volatile period when would israel really try to strike or subvert and derail the iranian uh, nuclear program how would iran respond to it having extended its influence both towards the east and west and more assured of the russian and the chinese support now we also would have to look at the the weakness of israel uh, in the political instability how would bennett's government would it survive will the israeli voters again if there is a re election vote back a hung house uh, and Israel remains a country badly divided uh, inside between hawks not really doves but those who who are tired of warfare want a dividend of peace but the centrists are non-existent but there there are interesting clashes between one theocratic jewish state and another theocratic islamic state one might say that the americans are not exactly a non-religious state either as we discussed the domestic politics of america Uh, is also governed to a large extent by christian evangelists their theocratic views on abortion on same sex marriages on um, trials of various medicines clinical trials stem cell research uh, life and death euthanasia so the religion seems to play an extremely interesting role in all major countries uh, you might say that uh, china is an atheistic country but russia does go back to its uh, orthodox christian heritage and some would suggest that even the communist party acts as a church in china so but we'll leave it at that so this is something which you must think it through we also have to worry about the other hot spots developing elsewhere towards the north uh, the japanese sea towards the northern sea uh, opening out in the pacific and what might happen there in near future would it be tensions would be reduced after the nato military nato and japanese military exercises are over or would japan try to reinforce its military strength 
to be independent to defend its core interests in the region. It is difficult to imagine Japan is taking, uh, taking on the Russians and reclaiming the Kuril Islands or opting for a nuclear option to protect themselves. They would have to be having a credible reassurance from the Americans, which at the moment seems to be not very much there. So we will have to look at this and we will have to examine all these questions from the point of view of India's interest, India's national interest, India's foreign policy. Till we meet again, thank you and goodbye.